so much. I'm so sorry that I couldn't be there with you all today, however much I would really like to be back in Palestine. But I'm hoping that the conference is going very well. And although I can't be there, I've chosen to present my paper um, through video. So my name is Crystal Leonis, and I come from a centre called the Centre for Contemporary Art and Politics, and we're from Sydney, Australia. And the title of my paper today is Disoriented Laughter, Laughter, Exile and Emergency in the Work of Emily Jassir and Jackie Saloon. So, fittingly, I thought I'd start with a joke. The joke goes like this. The Iraqis wrote on their flag, God is great. The Jordanians wrote, may God protect us. The Israelis, God is with us. The Saudis, there is no God but Bush. And the Palestinians, God will compensate us. At the end of the first Gulf War, and after the defeat of Iraq, Palestinians considered the situation of great loss to themselves. Yet a joke from the time, whose punchline indicates Palestinians will be compensated by God, reveals a certain samud in the face of defeat. What the joke crystallizes is not only Palestinian attitudes to their own position, but also, in five brief sentences, summarizes the role and attitude of major national players in the war. Palestinian humor, manifesting jokes such as this one, is revelatory, and in a joke like this, covers in four brief words the effects of exile and emergency within the Palestinian condition. It can be said that this is the age of exile, and that this location from an individual's homeland or place of birth can be described as the condition of the last century. Though our contemporary globalised world is increasingly filled with mobile expatriates, cosmopolitans and diasporic peoples, a binary between these peoples can be observed. One that is dependent on their free will and ability to move. For the refugee, and indeed for the exile, mobility and homelessness is not the result of choice, but rather an imposition projected upon them as an outcome of occupation, environmental disaster, or political turmoil. For Palestinians, the experience of disorientation or exile from the homeland came as a consequence of the proverbial people of exile, the Jews. As a result of this disorientation, there has been in recent years substantial efforts in the reclamation of Palestinian history and culture. These endeavours have sought to bring Palestinian culture out from beneath the monolith of Jewish history, to reveal Palestinian identity and its relationship to the continual processes of occupation. Despite these cultural and intellectual efforts, however, there remains a paucity of research and text dealing with both Palestinian humour and Palestinian art. Though there is a growing scholarly emphasis on Palestinian art, there remains, with the notable exception of Sharif Kanan, a seemingly scholarly neglect of the revelations implicit in Palestinian humour and in their laughter. In so doing, the Academy has neglected these fields that reveal much to us about the Palestinian condition and the effects of Israeli violence. This is perhaps because both art and humour do not initially seem to carry the weight necessary in the face of continuing Israeli occupation. To neglect both fields, however, is to overlook the potential of two phenomena of Palestinian culture, who, when put together, provide both foreign and Palestinian audiences a fresh, fresh insight into the Palestinian condition. In short, both offer a new tone and composition for the important task of retelling the Palestinian story. Edward Said often explained the Palestinian preoccupation with narrating their collective history. In a 1989 interview, Said explains, there seems to be nothing in the world sustaining the Palestinian story. In other words, if you stop telling it, it is just going to disappear. Whereas, you feel other narratives are there, and they have a kind of permanent and institutional existence, and you have to chip away at them. In the years since Said's interview and his death, there have been considerable efforts to record Palestinian history and experience in order to give it both an archival place and to achieve understanding of the Palestinian condition. 
The process of writing or creating Palestinian art carries with it the same obstacles described by Said, and he's seeking to find both the language and the appropriate archival place to record the narrative. However, what actually compounds the difficulty in retelling the Palestinian story through art is both the paucity of research into the field and the fact that internationally it remains difficult to write, curate or exhibit art dealing with the occupation and oppression faced by Palestinians. Art professionals eager to do so are often faced with censorship and charges of anti-Semitism. In spite of this, Palestinian artists continue to create works dealing with the Palestinian experience. For many, the need to represent the Palestinian narrative has meant that they operate within both the documentary practice and aesthetic. These documentary efforts do not, however, come without problems. The documentary aesthetic inherits certain limitations and coupled alongside what might be described as a trauma fatigue toward the banal evil of the Israeli state, contemporary Palestinian artists in recent years have increasingly sought to move beyond the documentary and contemporary art practice. Resisting the urge to maintain their documentary place within the regime of representation, contemporary Palestinian artists Emily Jassir and Jackie Saloum fracture what is described as the genre regime through their employment of humour. A closer inspection of their work reveals the potential for humour to both elide censorship and implicate audiences, functioning as an alternative access point for understanding Israeli violence. The worth the work of both Jassir and Saloum reveals not only manifestations of Israeli violence, but also illustrates the ways that humour and art can move beyond the parameters of literary and linguistic definition and discussion of collective trauma inflicted by Israel. The necessity for an archival and institutional place was, as mentioned earlier, for Edward Said central to bringing the Palestinian story into popular consciousness. The efforts to create this archival place for Palestinian history are made most clear visually in Emily Jassir's 2001 work, Untitled. The piece is not humorous, but it does crack open all the latent issues pertaining to the lack of a Palestinian archival place, while simultaneously revealing the limitations of language in a recording of history. A discrete installation, the work is comprised of books related to Palestinian culture, all wedged in the niche between two walls. Without a shelf to support them, the books rely on one another to maintain their raised position within two walls. When one first encounters the work, the books seem as if they are floating on this imaginary shelf. Despite being published texts and therefore archived objects, the absence of a shelf on which to rest alludes to the notion that the texts are yet to find a fixed place and presence in the archive. The absent shelf obliges the texts to rely literally upon one another to coalesce a solidarity of narrative, in other words, a history. In his poem, Identity Card, Mahmoud Darwish explains, record, I am an Arab, I have a name without a title. Jassir's untitled work encapsulates Palestinian identity with the same sentiment employed by da Darwish in Identity Card. In contrast to the rest of her oeuvre, the installation is the only one with an absent title and means that its crux literally concerned with the absence of definition and the lack of a title itself. The absence of a definitive title in Jassir's work perhaps refers to the Palestinian people themselves, who for historians like Joan Peters are occasionally argued to not exist at all as a culturally and geographically specific group. It is the absence of a title that actually accentuates the need for a definition and for a name. Without a definitive name, one might describe Untitled as the book work or the shelf work, the same way that some, like Joe Peters, might refer to Palestinians merely as Arabs or local peasants. It must be mentioned that ironically, Untitled is actually found pictured alongside theoretical texts concerned with Jassir, but more often than not, the work is not written about, evaluated, or discussed. 
This is perhaps because untitled is discreet and elusive in presence and in meaning. In such a way, it stands in contrast to the majority of Jasir's works that are quite forthright in their political motivations and their messages. The installation is such that um, in exhibition you might entirely miss the work or indeed neglect to realise it was an artwork at all. If we are to accept that Untitled is concerned with the need to tell the Palestinian story and for it to achieve an archival place, its elusive presence in exhibition alludes to the lack of acknowledgement, not only for the work itself, but also for the Palestinian narrative. Uncomfortably wedged between two walls, the books in Untitled have nowhere to rest or lean unless they are to fall down entirely. One cannot help but relate these signifiers of Palestinianness, uncomfortably confined between walls, to Palestinians li living in the occupied territories. Surrounded and confined by the security wall and blockades, Palestinians, like the books in Untitled, are too literally confined by walls. The buoyancy of text in Untitled is nonetheless forged by solidarity between narratives. It is the solidarity of narratives that is in direct dialogue with Said, who, speaking in reference to the Palestinian story, tells us that there seems to be nothing in the world that sustains it. Unless you go on telling it, it will just drop and disappear. So once the story ceases to be told, the solidarity of narrative would be lost just as it would, quite literally, in Jassir's Untitled. But more importantly, um, it is as though Jassir's Untitled work highlights the central concern of art theory and trauma studies in the last 60 years, and in doing so brings it into a Palestinian context. Uh, what I mean by that is that one of the chief concerns of art theory since the events of the Second World War has been to understand the best ways of narrating collective traumatic history, which, is, which has in an archival sense been subordinated or destroyed. The wide breadth of research in, uh, into collective trauma and memory, particularly in relation to art, has been understandably spearheaded by Holocaust studies. Though there is a certain reluctance to draw a correlation to the Holocaust, it is next to impossible to discuss trauma without looking to its epistemological anchor um, that weighs upon the Jewish Holocaust in World War II. The central premise of Holocaust studies pertains to Palestinian art and intellectual endeavours because it is informed by the difficulties embedded in conveying collective trauma through representation. Indeed, Holocaust studies has in the past centred on the impossibility of language and linguistic structure in the face of cultural and social decimation. So in such a way, it actually very much pertains to the Palestinian condition. Um, given that, it's worthwhile going through the kind of epistemological background of uh, trauma theory, cope with suffering. Following Adorno's suggestion, it may be argued that it is the cognitive incomprehensibility of trauma that leads to laughter. Terence Dupre, father of the term Holocaust laughter, has, was one of the first to question whether laughter was an appropriate mode of treatment for the Holocaust, noting that it was perhaps what he calls a Holocaust etiquette that excluded humour from representations of trauma. For Dupre, the etiquette is spawned from a history of solemnity toward trauma that found its regime, that found its roots in what he calls the regime of truth. Yet like all regimes, the regime of truth does not come without its corresponding problems. The primary contradiction inherent in Dupre's claim is, as Jacqueline Busky notes, the Holocaust victims actually did laugh. Further, the regime of truth, that is to say, an absolute faithfulness to the facts of the event, does not leave room for creative responses to trauma, nor does it adequately answer to affective and visceral consequences generated from such creative responses. Fortunately, trauma studies has evolved to accommodate the creative acts to apply to trauma, and there has been much work on this. Um, and this creative uh, act might be manifest in the form of a joke, or indeed an art installation.
but both simultaneously reveal the inability of language and the regime of truth in the comprehension and communication of trauma. So, um, moving back to the Palestinian case. The Palestinian case of collective trauma in the face of Israeli violence and occupation would actually appear um, to have a similar truth regime at play. That is not to say that this regime is enforced by Palestinians, nor that the regime exists without due warrant. For the primary instigator of the truth regime is the need to bring a submerged, tra uh, submerged tragic and opaque history to light. And as such, Palestinians in creative field have relied upon the documentary in both its adjective and noun form to tell the story. The reliance on the documentary has placed Palestinians, art, Palestinian artists of all medium, that is film, art, into what political philosopher Jacques Ranciere describes as the distribution of genre. Rancière's conception of genre distribution is echoed by legendary filmmaker Jean Luc Godard, who in his 2004 film Notre Musique states that in 1948 the Jews walked out of the water to the Holy Land, the Palestinians walked into the water, the Jews became the stuff of fiction, and the Palestinians became the documentary. Um, Godard's ironic distribution of genres between Israelis and Palestinians suggests, as Jacques Rancière notes, that the division between the freedom of fiction and the reality of the news is always already a distribution of possibilities and capacities. For Rancière, this division creates a world that is divided between those who can and those who cannot afford the luxury of playing with images. In such a world, Palestinians, he considers, can only offer the bodies of their victims to the gaze of news cameras, or to the compassionate gaze at their suffering. The Palestinian visual place within the spectrum of this distribution of genres and its correspondence to the regime of truth is made more complicated by the lack of suitable linguistic terminology to describe and document the all-engrossing and systematic processes of Israeli violence. In his article entitled Speechlessness, Levely Greenberg discusses the plethora of descriptions and terms used to explain and portray the occupation of Palestinians. This critical language, as you all know, is vast and includes terms like apartheid, sociocide, ethnocracy, bantustanism, politicide, colonization, and fanatical politics. But what is significant about Greenberg's approach is that whilst acknowledging the validity of such terms, he highlights their insufficiency to describe the breadth and the depth and the magnitude of manifestations of Israeli violence. This is, as Greenberg points out, further hastened by the fact that the Israeli state has co-opted much of this language, thus rendering the vocabulary deficient as a descriptor of Israeli violence. Greenberg explains, every subversive wor word that exposes and condemns the intention and meaning of Israel's actions in the Palestinian context is sterilized, taken out of political context, and stripped of its true meaning the moment it emerges. All our words become complicit to the concealment, and this in turn makes us complicit to the concealment. In order to align his own complicity in the concealment of meaning, Grimberg chooses, interestingly, to describe the processes and manifestations of occupation as, quote, the thing without a name. In so doing, Grimberg highlights the deficiencies of language to convey processes of collective violence and trauma. To his credit, Grimberg is actually self-critical enough to also acknowledge the contradiction inherent in his own efforts, and indeed my own in presenting this paper pointing out that through the creation of critical language to describe such an occupation, academia is also facilitating a process of disengagement from the conflict. Um, and it's here that I'll say that the Palestine-Israel conflict is at its heart actually crippled by disengagement. And to clarify my own position in this, it would seem that the conflict has interestingly um, and increasingly internationally been presented as a stalemate. So the presentation of the conflict as though it is an impasse 
but would seem to be at the root of why it seems that globally many have remained utterly complacent in the face of Israeli violence. It might be suggested here that this complacency comes as a result of what Hannah Arendt famously described as banal evil. <clears throat> to understand Hannah Arendt's conception of banal evil, we must again return to World War II, as her conception came as a result of the notorious Eichmann trials, and through her observation that the abhorrent behaviour under Nazi German rule saw moral and ethical conduct diminished. The loss of basic ethics in this chapter of history is argued by Arendt, amongst others, to have come as a result of the normalisation of processes of humiliation and violence. In short, the evil, evil systematic conduct of the masses was rendered banal through its everydayness. Those Zionist sympathisers might be reluctant to call the manifestations of Israeli violence evil. It may be argued that Israel's daily, daily systematic acts of humiliation and occupation, that is, the process without a name, has become a new breed of banal evil. Indeed, it is the magnitude of such daily systematic and immersive state processes of physical, emotional and, of course, psychological violence that leave writers such as Lev Louis Greenberg incapable of describing it with suitable terminology. So, if we are to accept that the actions of the Israeli state can be seen as the new banal evil, the question remains as to how best fracture the global indifference and fatigue towards this violence. And it can be here tentatively suggested that laughter and humour possess qualities capable of interrupting the fatigue, banality and authority of the Israeli state and its violence. Rather than focus, as humorologists are prone to do, on the three main strands of humour theory, that is superiority, incongruity and relief theory, it is more pertinent to this study and to this paper uh, to look at the consequences of the humour evident in Palestinian art. Such a process will involve looking not to the psychological instigations um, of humour, but rather the results of this humour upon the audience and even upon ourselves. Looking even to just two examples of humour in Palestinian art, we swiftly realise that humour above anything else teaches us about ourselves. But it has the potential to empathically implicate audiences, such as ourselves, to rise above the authority of aggressors and to reveal the inability of language to convey the absurdity of evil, violence and occupation. Internationally renowned artist Emily Jassir has in the, in the past spoken of how difficult it is for both artists and curators to critically engage with the state violence of Israel and the pressures they feel in regards to censorship, particularly in the United States, where she divides her time. In a 2005 interview, she states that she could talk for hours about censorship in this country, that is the US, in regards to Palestine, Palestinian narratives, or Palestinian anything. Jasir and her work is characterized by the revelation of subordinate narratives and histories, alongside a documentation of her own subversive acts. Uh, though Jasir is now both a prolific and internationally recognised artist, having even won the prestigious Biennale Prize of the Golden Lion in 2007, it is one of her minor works, Sexy Semite, from 2000 to 2002, that best opens discussion regarding uh, poten the potential of humour in Palestinian art. So, Sexy Semite uh, essentially consists of a series of personal advertisements in the New York Village Voice newspaper. Upon first glance, the advertisements, despite being sexually provocative, do not overly distinguish themselves from their neighboring advertisements. Um, just these advertisements include acronyms like LTR, and for those of you that aren't familiar, LTR stands for Long-Term Relationship, and takes on her ads take on the format, font, and standard appearance of other advertisements. Yet, to the informed reader, one quickly realises that the long-term relationship, or LTR, put on display here by Jasir, 
refers not to the not to any personal relationship, but to the relationship between Palestinians and Jews, and more specifically the long-term issue of the continual denial of the right of return. The relevance of the informed reader is not to be underestimated, as it is at the crux of what provides humour to the work. For at the moment we laugh at the piece, our laughter signals our understanding of Jassir's subversive and covert message. In his seminal text on the philosophy of laughter, entitled On Humour, philosopher Simon Critchley notes that, in a sense, having a common sense of humour is like sharing a secret code. In the case of Sexy Semite, the embedded secret code can be witnessed in almost every word of the text, but primarily in Jassir's bittersweet mention of still having keys to a house, by the reference of the falafel as being Palestinian, and by referring to herself as a sexy Semite, thereby undermining the popular conception of the word Semite as referring only to Jews. For some tuned in viewers, uh, such assertions would prove to be not only revealing but also offensive. So, that having been said, of course, her advertisements did not go unnoticed. Their provocative content, namely that of a marriage to secure a life in Israel, was reported on by the New York Post. The article quotes a rabbi named Abraham Cooper speaking in regards to the advertisement, saying, they use the system to beat the system. The rabbi's comment is mirrored by the artwork itself. When Jassir has used the medium of the personal's advertisement and the newspaper against itself, and in so doing, actually collapses the personal Palestinian experience um, and desire with the collective need and longing for the right of return. The artist's subversive act defamiliarizes, rather, the familiarity of personal advertisements, and in so doing, opens the secret code and becomes humorous. As Simon Critchley points out, the process of defamiliarization means that humor views the world awry, bringing us back to the everyday by estranging us from it. So what happens then after the moment of defamiliarization when the gaggle leaves our lips and again we return to solemnity, uh, which may have happened for some of you with the first joke in this paper. Uh, this question is of principal importance when looking at Palestinian humorous art and is particularly pertinent to the work of Palestinian artist Jacqueline or Jackie Saloon. The artist's work, Caterpillar, I play on the word Caterpillar, from 2002, is a keen example of the process of humorous defamiliarization in art. It does so chiefly in three dimensions. The first is through the defamiliarization of an art object. The second is through the defamiliarization of a children's toy. And the third is through the defamiliarization of a process that has catastrophically become all too familiar for Palestinians. That is the confiscation and destruction of Palestinian property and homes. Uh, not to mention daily ter terrorization. Uh, Saloon's decision to create a caterpillar bulldozer in the scale and form of a children's toy, might initially appear to trivialise the despair brought forth from Israel's employment of these machines. Yet despite this, the typical response to her work is actually laughter. It is perhaps the artist scaling down, um, both literally and symbolically, of such a devastatingly familiar object that causes us to laugh. Seen from the perspective of a child, this art object might indeed actually appear as a toy, similar to those played with by children all around the world. In one view then, Saloon's treatment of the bulldozer might actually be seen to actively amplify the tragedy of land confiscation by suggesting that the destruction uh, it brings forth is merely the result of a plaything, a toy. If this is the case, then through her artwork, Saloon has created a world where tragedy exists in excess. The bitter laughter with which we engage with Saloon's work might be interpreted as an indecent revelation, exposing our ability to laugh both at and with 
the suffering of Palestinians. It is at this moment, that is the moment of our indecent revelation, that we realize that there is indeed um, a fine line between tragedy and comedy. That indeed comedy is merely tragedy too excessive to be true. It is here then that our laughter reveals much about ourselves. The artist Jackie Sloons, Caterpillar offers us two motivations for our delight in it, the way that I see it in any case. The first may be our acknowledgement of the secret code in the work. That is our understanding of the Israeli state's mass employment of uh, land confiscation practices. The second motivation is one of empowerment, whereby Saloon has created for us an imaginary world where Israeli bulldozers are actually too minuscule uh, to wreak the destruction or any destruction on Palestinian property. Caterpillar's scale serves to belittle Israeli destruction and the violence that it represents. In such a regard, our laughter in response to Saloon's work might, as Jacqueline Bussey suggests, render the oppressor's authority as suspect. The moment in which we laugh at both our suffering and the plight of other oppressed peoples calls into question the potential of humour to not only describe tragedy, something we've seen is very difficult to do, and oppression, but also to provide tools of empowerment in the face of it.